from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. It is the 27th of June, 2016 today, and we are here in Los Angeles, California. This is David Klein from the History Department at Virginia Tech and working with the Civil Rights History Project of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, we have with us John Bishop of Media Generation behind the camera. Also, Guha Shankar of the Library of Congress is here with us. And we are so honored uh, to be uh, here with Norma Mtume. Uh, and if I could ask you, this is the one time I will coach you at all, to introduce yourself with a full sentence, my name is or I am, uh, and where you were born and what year. Okay. I am Norma Mtume currently. Um, I was born in 1949 in San Diego, California, Norma Stoker. Um, and later I married, so my name was Norma Armour. At the time I was in the Black Panther Party, my name was Norma Armour. Mm -hmm. So I just, for historical purposes, for my children or my grandchildren, I wanted to make sure that those names were Wonderful. on file. Thank you. Thank you for And can coming. you tell me about the adoption of, of Mtume? Um, well, I married an Mtume mm -hmm. who changed his name in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, as a lot of us were doing. Uh, we didn't want our slave names anymore. Right. Um, and so he chose Mtume. Um, his name is Omawale Mtume, and it means the sun returns. And it, it's uh, Kiswahili and uh, Nigerian. It's powerful. Yeah. 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 So, it, wonderful. And if you could tell, let's start with your childhood or even um, before your parents and tell me a little bit about. Um, all right, my, my mother uh, was Doris Sims. She was from, born in uh, Louisiana, but raised in Arkansas and Louisiana. Came to California during the World War II, moved to Vallejo, where you know folks were going to where they could work in the war industry. My dad was born in Longview, Texas. Um, he went to the military, and after he got out, he moved to San Diego, uh, became a librarian, of all things. <laughs> um, and. I lived in San Diego until I was about four, then moved to Los Angeles with my mom. My, my folks split up. and So I'd been in the Los Angeles area most of my life, moved away while I was in the party for a few years, moved up north, uh, came back home to Roost, and pretty much been here since. Mm -hmm. Can you, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about the racial geography of Los Angeles during those years, and if that shaped mm. it you at all? Uh, it did. And, and I, I, I tell you, my, my, my first experience, even thinking about me being in the skin, really a, a lot, um, where I lived in Los Angeles, it was primarily African Americans or Negroes or coloreds or blacks, so, you know, as we became over the years. Um, and very few uh, Latinos who were pretty much all Mexican. Um, one or two Asian. As you came further west, we had more Japanese. You went further north, more Korean. Um, but where I lived, it was, it was mainly black people. Um, very poor neighborhood. I grew up in South Central, um, around 21st and Naomi, for those of you who know Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, Almost everybody came to school with cardboard in their shoes when they started wearing out. I mean, it, it was no, you didn't think of yourself as super poor until you were able to get out of that environment and see what other people had because the other people around you, they pretty much had what you had or, or didn't have what you didn't have, rather. Um, when I was in high school uh, in the mid-60s, um, you started to become a little bit more conscious about what's going on there, what's going on around the world. Some of our uh, older brothers and neighbors and friends, and as we got to be seniors, some of our boy boyfriends were drafted, went to Vietnam. Um, I think that opened a lot of folks' eyes, um, especially when we saw the guys, the ones that made it back. They didn't come back quite the same, and a lot of them have never been the same since then. Um, like I said, very poor. I managed to get a scholarship, $250 from high school to go to college, you know, go figure. That would buy about a book and a half these days. Right. Uh, um, so I, I, I went to uh, Jefferson High School, um, which was basically all black. We had 
two uh, Caucasians, two brothers, that, I mean, we remember the Cromwells, I mean, because they're the only ones in this whole school. Um, but that, that's kind of what the neighborhood was like. We, we were poor, and then when, the, when riots started, when people started really, really feeling like, you know, enough is enough, we really don't have what we need to survive. Um, folks got angry, and, and they started doing what they thought they needed to do to, to get some attention. What year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 67. Okay. In 1967. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was just just after we had the big Watts uh, uprising. Um, after I graduated, I went to Cal State LA, mm -hmm. and we had a very active uh, black student union there. Had you um, done anything in high school? Were there any organizations yet? I didn't. I, I was too busy trying to pull myself up by my bootstraps, mm -hmm. not knowing at the time that I really didn't have any boots to put straps in. Um, I was going to college. I was going to be a math and PE teacher, um, majoring in uh, math and minoring in PE. Um, then I started meeting some of the students on campus who were active in the BSU. And I, I met my first husband, Albert Armour. He was very active um, in the Black Student Union and later became a, a Black Panther Party member. And that's how I got involved with the Panthers. Because um, I, I really wasn't involved in, in very much before then. Mm -hmm. Do, are, are you able to sort of go back and try to remember the first time that you became aware of the Panthers and trying to figure out what the ideology was or what this was about? Um, I know he, he had Panther stickers on his car. He had a little a blue VW bug and when he would come to the house and then he would have the uh, Mohammed Speaks newspaper with him so he, he was just all he was getting information from everywhere and he would come to the house and my mother would just be really really upset she didn't want him coming over anymore with that you know that Black Panther and that Black Muslim stuff. Um, I, he took me to an anti, uh, a war protest rally, the, the big one that was out at, uh, in Westwood, and I believe it was in 67, late 67 or summer 67, and it's when it, it, it disrupted, it just erupted, and they started beating heads and stuff, and, and I'm standing around looking. I've, I've never been exposed to anything like this before. So if I knew that they're dragging me, come on, come on, we got to get out of here. So I was actually there at that rally, and that was my first time, you know, saying, you know, this, this, really, this really isn't right. I didn't watch a whole lot of TV. I was always into the books and reading, and I didn't have time. So I saw that. Um, that was early 67, and um, my husband became a full-fledged member of the party. He dropped out of college. I was still going to school. Um, he kept trying to get me to come around and do things, but I, I just, you know, I, I didn't have time for that. I, I had another avenue that I was going to take. But in December 69, when the police raided all the party offices here, he was in one of the offices, and they beat him up pretty badly. Um, he, he was in the hospital for a while, broke his arm, um, damaged one of his eye sockets pretty badly. Um, and then that, that got my attention. That, that woke me up. And that was in December. Uh, and by January, I was volunteering at the local office on 41st Street. Uh, what was left of it, you know, we still were trying to function out of there. I started doing uh, typing. Uh, for the officer of the day, uh, type memos for him and whatnot. And then I worked in the breakfast program mm -hmm. and the clinic was starting here. And, and I always had an interest in the body and in health. I guess that's why I like physical education. Other than it was just fun, I like to play. Um, and so I was assigned to, to work at the clinic and I became the, the coordinator, the person who ran the clinic. Um, that that was some experience. I was I was nineteen years old. <laughs> it's amazing how young everyone yes. was and what you were all took on. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I, I had a lot of help from there were a lot of professionals who were willing to lend their time and talents and skills. Mm -hmm. uh, Marie Branch was a an RN and she taught at UCLA and Terry Coopers was a psychi psychiatrist and they helped us to get uh, residents and 
doctors to volunteer, nursing students and nurses to come and volunteer at the clinic, and we didn't have any paid staff there, and, and that's These how These are we all African-American health professionals? No, no. 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 Marie Branch is African-American, Dr. Cooper's is white, um, but we, we had an assortment of, of, you know, it was a real good mixture of uh, diversity that we had there. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I ask you, since we're on that, about mm -hmm. other sort of coalitions mm -hmm. um, that formed at that time, partners that you worked with? Um, well, the, there were the, the nurse, the student nurses, mm -hmm. uh, health educators, um, some of the doctors who were, were really liberals. They had their, their associations that they were with. But I, I was just really, really focused on running the clinic. And that, that was a full-time job because besides care, caring for the community, we had to care for the party members. And now I'm doing work at, with uh, Drew Medical School and, and looking at health disparities. And, you know, we're the sickest people in the world. The, the community that I come from, we have, um, well, the sickest people in this country. Uh, and a lot of our illnesses compare real closely to what's going on in some third world countries in terms of our, our um, birth rates, still birth rates, uh, low birth rate children, uh, in, in miscarriages and things like that. But I'm just saying that to say that I didn't really have time to do a whole lot of the things. I was focused on running the clinic and the health of the party members and uh, the people that we served at the clinic. Mm -hmm. And that that was more than a full-time job. So let's start from the beginning because you're 19 <laughs> years old. You'd had a year of college at this point or so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And are assigned this task. It was a lot of self-study. Had the clinic opened yet? The clinic, I was there, the clinic opened. They had okay. the next opening day. And mm -hmm. then you were told you'll be running this. Yeah. But, and, and, <laughs> so well, what I mean, happens? <laughs> what you, happens on day you, one? you just get it in gear. You do a lot of self-study. You do a lot of reading. And like I said, I had a lot of mentors, from, especially from Marie Branch, who was the nurse and the, the, the nursing instructor. Um, she gave me things to read. She, she just taught me. I mean... I mean, she taught me how to eat yogurt. I didn't even know what yogurt was. I'd never had yogurt when I was 19 years old. That wasn't what we ate. Um, but, you know, various uses for it. And a lot of um, natural healing uh, practices we discussed as well. Um, I don't know. It was just you, you, you learned. You got books. You found people. You, we didn't have an Internet, so you had to hustle and get that information the best that you could. And... It, it just, I learned a lot in a little bit of time. Can, can you describe the physical place of the, of the clinic? The it, was, clinic? Uh, it was a storefront. Mm -hmm. We had um, a, um, a lab tech student whose father was a construction uh, a contractor. So he had been working with his father for a long time. He came in and built the, the lab out for us. And we were able to put up petitions so that we could have different operating rooms. So he, he built out the lab and he built us a farm, pharmacy area. We um, worked with the farm. That was one of the things that the doctors did was to work with the pharmaceutical reps who came to their place and asked them to give us samples. So that was where we got most of our medication so that we could give it to the folks who came to the clinic for free. Um, so it, we, we got it built out. I'm not a good judge of square footage, but we had... Uh, Three exam rooms, a little reception area, an area for the pharmacy and the lab here in Los Angeles. And what was the location? It was at 32nd and Central. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's been completely free. Well, we had to pay rent for the building. Right, but, but for And the... our utility, it was free. Everything was free. We didn't charge for anything. Mm -hmm. People could get donations when they came in. Mm -hmm. um, but all, all care was free. So did it take some I mean, some outreach to let people know that you were there and that this, oh, yes. that there weren't strings attached? And yes, yes, and and we did that outreach in the community. But when folks came out to sell, went out to sell papers as well. You know, there was information about the clinic, and there were articles in our newspaper about the various clinics around the country. Uh, and we collected donations on the street for the clinic too, so folks got to learn about the clinic that way. Do, do you remember any of the sort of um, the why we're going to do a clinic, the justification or the ideology that said that this is important? Yes, it was one of one of the points of our ten point platform and program. Uh, I think it's number four 
that, that we, we want decent health care. We want health care that, you know, keeps us healthy to start with, but gets us well when we get sick. Um, and so we were just carrying out um, our, our platform that we said that the reason that we existed. Um, we knew that we had substandard um, housing, uh, education, health care. We were the most that got beat up by the police. We were going to prison more than anybody else. So those were the things that we really were stepped out to uh, address. I'll, I'll come back to the clinic, but I want to I, I wanna sort of ask about um, daily life of a young woman in the L.A. chapter of the Panthers. What, what was it like? Uh, what, what was the what was daily life? A, a, a young woman with a two year old child. Yeah. Well, let's see. Maybe he was a year and a half when when I f finally, after my husband uh, got out of, got out of the out of the hospital, and I started coming around more. Eventually, I gave up my apartment and I just moved into the party facilities as well. Me and my son. Uh, shortly after I got pregnant with my daughter, uh, that's Albert Armour the third and Layla. Or more, um, and so when we went in the party, there were a lot of women just like me. They they had children, so we had to make provisions so that the children could be safe and cared for. So we had a nursery for the children, because we worked long, long hours. I mean, we would be up in the morning in order, you know, five thirty six in order to get ready for the breakfast program. So we get the kids fed, and then folks would go off to their various uh, work. Assignments. I would go to the clinic. Other folks would go to the field. Other people might be working in um, the office where we put together our, our flyers, our posters. Um, a couple of the couple of the few of the main writers for the newspaper were from the Los Angeles chapter, so they would go to Oakland, you know, for a few days a week to work on the newspaper. So the children had to be taken care of, and so that that was first and foremost. So we made sure that we put that in place. So you'd go out, strike out to the clinic about 9.30 or 10. You work there to like 6 or so. And we often had evening clinics as well because the regular people, they have to go to work. And so they can't take off work because they lose money. So we had lots of evening clinics. And that's how we were able to get a number of our doctors to volunteer as well because once they got off work, then they could come and volunteer their time at night. So there were days when you may be at the clinic to 10 10 or 11, you know, cleaning up and getting ready for the next day. Then if you got back to the centers early enough, you ate dinner, you had political education class maybe. Um, and if you were on guard duty, because everybody had to have a guard shift, um, we didn't want what was, happened to Fred Hampton to happen to us. You know, you, you just didn't know. Somebody had to be watching all the time. So we would come back from our daily assignments and if we didn't do political education class or have some other kind of meeting or a rally or something that we needed to go to, you were lucky you might get in the bed by 12, mm -hmm. <laughs> 11 mm -hmm. or 12, get a couple hours sleep, then you get up for your couple hours of duty to on uh, security watch and go back to sleep and you get up and you do it all over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that the, the work ethic that we got the, at such a young age, how we learned how to work like that, uh, nobody can outwork us these days. You know, when you later when you go into a regular job, they they just can't do it. They're not used to that kind of work, and I'm not saying that that's something that you should try to sustain for a lifetime, because <laughs> it's it's really hard, and it and it's it's wearing on your body over time. But that that's what we felt that we needed to do, and that's what we did. You mentioned um, Fred Hampton, and um, can you can you talk a little bit more about the harassment and fear and intimidation and targeting and that that you all experienced? Yes, we had uh, we were harassed and targeted by the police, but other groups that we had different ideological or perspectives. Um, uh, one example was uh, one day, and, and we did this, everything was uh, communal, you know, the laundry, everything got, if you were assigned to do laundry duty, you might have, you know, four or five people and their family, the kids' laundry to do. So my girlfriend and I were going to do laundry one evening, 
And as soon as we pull out of the, the uh, parking space, there's the police. You know, they, they, they just stayed right there and waited for you to drive off so that they could stop you and harass you for some petty uh, traffic infraction that they say that, that you might have uh, committed. Um, and so we're sitting there and one police goes to his car and then he comes back and he's got this whole portfolio of photos. So he starts asking me these people's names, people that are in the party. And then he had my license, so he knew my name. So he first he pulled up my husband's picture and said, who is that? I said, oh, that's my brother. So I think for the longest, without them doing any deep checking, they thought that we were brother and sister. Uh, eventually, I think they caught on. But, but I mean, that every time you left, you would look to see if there was a patrol car or an unmarked car on the street. And uh, I think the, the women got off a little bit easier sometimes than the guys. The guys, got, they just knew as soon as they walked out the gate with their papers under their arm, they were going to get harassed or they were going to get arrested uh, or they were going to be a beat or, or whatever. Um, so it, it, it was constant. And at night, you know, especially after um, the, the raids on the various offices and all, you just, you didn't know if, if, if you were, your number was up next. But you, you just, if you had that commitment, you stayed. People that didn't and, and you know, they figure, you know, I, I want to do something else with my life. I don't want to give it up this way. Then they leave. So, you know, people came and they went. Uh, some people stayed longer than others. Did you have strategies for coping? Uh, drinking and drugging? <laughs> This might be one of the things I tell you to take out. <laughs> but no, I mean, we, if, you know, when we had a chance to cool down, if we had, we had might have a party or a birthday party or saying, something. This is stress. It, this it is. is high it's, stress. it's high, high stress. Yeah. It's a wonder some of us didn't stroke out or something. Mm -hmm. um, no, we, I mean, we, that, I, I recognized early on that there were a lot of folks who had alcohol problems and, um, Later on, started using different types of drugs. But then we have to remember that these are people that came in from the community. People that joined the party, they were already doing those kinds of things. When they came into the party, they were able to clean up for, because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't allowed. You weren't, you couldn't be a, a, a drug head and, and alcoholic every day and, and do the work that you needed to do. So that, that wasn't condoned. But because we were who we were, you know, we, some of us slipped back into those those habits. But no, there, there, were, there were, we had a psychiatrist who uh, worked with us. Um, like I said, Dr. Coopers was a psychiatrist and up north we had a Dr. Shapiro, I think his name was. Um, and every now and then, you know, some, somebody would really, you know, kind of go out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but for the everyday having mental health services or therapy or support groups and that kind of stuff, uh, other than just commiserating among yourselves. Uh, not that I can recall. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. What about the being a woman in the, in the, in the party? Um, and I know that numerically, I think, right, sisters made up the majority um, at certain points. Yeah, at, at certain points. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't the easiest thing. I mean, we... we Based on principles, we tried to make all things equal, you know, that, that women could do what men could do. Um, and the men, you know, the men cook, the men clean, the, there were men assigned to the, the children's centers and whatnot. Um, but like I said, we, the people that were in the party were people who were not in the party and came into the party. So they brought those same behaviors um, and, and you know, some, some chauvinism that not just men in our community, but all over the world, the, the patriarchal societies. Um, so that, that, that was something that you, you know, constantly had to deal with. Um, I would think it, at points it was a little bit alleviated, a little bit more alleviated, because eventually more and more women became, uh, uh, came into the leadership positions. Um, and it, it was something we, we had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Is there a special bond now among the, the veteran uh, Panther women? Oh yes, 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 <laughs> they are. They're, they're, and and 
it's like you, you, you were in high school and you have four or five people that, that you bond with. I mean, you don't bond with the whole class, but there, there are four or five of us who are, you know, still uh, talk uh, and um, commiserate about things that are going on now and reflect on things that were going on then. And, and uh, a couple of us were having this discussion about how our work ethic and how, you know, our, we, we serve the people body and soul was, you know, one of our slogans. And after a while, especially when you get closer to my age, you just have to start to pull that back and say, wait a minute, i got to take better care of myself. I can't give all of me away mm. every day, all day anymore. I really got to reel that back and now spend more time with my grandkids and, um, and my children and just, but yeah, we, we do. We, we have a, a good bond. and. Mm. It's those kind of friends that you would probably ne some people will never make in life. These are people that you trusted your life with, for real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did you, you go back a little bit for a second, but you talked about your, your parents' initial reaction um, to your boyfriend who would later become your husband. How did they handle your involvement in the party? Um, my, pa my, my mother, well, we had a free busing the prisons program. And my oldest brother was in um, San Quentin. Um, we were here in Los Angeles, so my mother had never been able to go and see him. So when we had a bus trip that was going up to San Quentin, I got my mom signed up, and she and I went to visit my brother in San Quentin. And she, before that and after that, she never went. After that, it was, it was no problem. The, what we were doing in the party was all right. She got an idea to... And, and over time, she got an idea to see some of the things that we were doing. Um, so she was okay with it. And my father, I think he was just more afraid for my safety. He, he, he came to accept it after a point, too. Um, my, my first uh, experience with discrimination that I can recall, my father used to take my brother and I to Texas every year. And we would drive. And normally, he lived in San Diego. We would stop in El Paso for halfway. And we would get a motel. Of course, that was like in 55, 56. So it was a black motel you would, would stay at. And then you would get up the next morning, get you some breakfast, and like drive the, on. The, the Green Book that had, hmm? do you remember? There's, I think it's called the Green Book that listed <laughs> oh. African-American-owned motels. For I don't know. My dad trips. just knew because he, oh, okay. you know, being from Texas and going back and forth the, all the time. Yeah. The right places. Yeah. But this one particular time we were going, I was about nine years old. We got to El Paso and the black uh, Baptist convention was going on. So all the black motels were taken up. Um, so we had, there was no room at the end. So my dad said, I got to stop and get some sleep. So he said, I'm just going to pull over on the side of the road here. You know, we'll get a couple hours of sleep. He pulls underneath some willow trees. Well, you know how the willow trees are going like, I said, Daddy, I can't sleep. <laughs> the trees are calling me. And I kept on and finally he just got up and, and, uh, and started driving. Well, it was morning. He said, I need to get some coffee and we need to get something to eat. Well, there everything still said no colors allowed and, you know, whites only and black water, I mean, colored water, white water. So my dad, he said, we got to stop. He pulled up to the restaurant and my stepmom was saying, oh, no, Calvin, you, you can't go in there. You can't go in there. He said, no, he's from Texas. He knows how to handle it. So he goes around to the back door. In about 15 minutes, he comes back and he's got coffee and donuts and food and stuff. He says, I mean, that's what you have to do. You know, you just have to suck it up. You know, you and your family have to eat. And you just go and do what they tell you to do. And you come out and we get in the car and we drive on. I'll never forget that as long as I live. That, that was my first introduction to, you know, I, I really am treated differently than other people. Do you remember what your thoughts were in your young mind just at, right at that moment? Yeah, and, and I was wondering, you know, well, why, why, why does Dad have to go in the back? And then when we actually got to my grandmother's house that year, we're passing this beautiful park with a nice swimming pool. We said, ooh, and, you know, Texas is humid. It's like July. And, oh, we can go swimming there. Dad says, no, hon, you can't swim there. Uh, but there, there's a, a, a black pool, you know, down the street. And we passed this beautiful high school. I said, oh, Dad, is that where you went? He says, no, 
we go on down the street and, and you can the stark differences in that park and the other park. But the thing that really got me is we were going to go to the drive-in one night. So we get to the drive-in movie. We have to go all the way in the back. The black people had to sit so far back that they had bleachers. You had to get out of your car to see the, the uh, screen. I mean, all of that in one trip. And so that, that's really imprinted in my mind. I, I never forget that. How old were you about? About that? nine, about eight or nine. nine. Mm -hmm. So that was where that had a big influence. Yeah. 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 And later on, you know, you start to reflect back on that. But when I get back to my own community, it's the same. So you don't really think about it that much anymore until you get older and start getting a little bit more consciousness about, well, there's a whole bunch of this stuff going on all the time. Um, and we need to do something about it. What were some of the other survival programs that the, the party had in place um, in Los Angeles? We had a, a food program um, where we gave away free bags of food, uh, groceries to folks who were in need. This is kind of pre-food bank type uh, uh, situations. We had a free clothing program, uh, free coats program in the winter, especially in those places like Chicago and New York where it got really, really cold. Could you imagine? Kids having to go to school and they don't have mm -hmm. coats to wear. Um, what else? Have we had? we had so many. We had a seniors program, Seniors Against the Fearful Environment. It was called Safe, mm -hmm. where we would escort seniors to uh, to the bank and to the grocery store to doctor's appointments. Um, in the clinics, we had outreach programs um, where we'd actually go out into the community and do some services. Mm -hmm. uh, that was. That was kind of novel, and I, I think we learned that from uh, watching what they were doing in Cuba and in China, mm -hmm. uh, the barefoot doctors who, who went out into the community to, to work with uh, people to keep them well and to get them well. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I have a whole book of what our programs were. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. um, a legal program where um, we help folks who needed uh, attorneys to find attorneys uh, pro bono or at, at, at lower rates. And we actually had people in the party who essentially were paralegals. They helped uh, prepare um, for the upcoming cases and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, we had free educational programs. We had the school, uh, which we were so proud of uh, in Oakland. But we, before you went to school, you went to the nursery. And I'm sure that Erica will talk a lot about <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. But um, as, as, as soon as mom was well enough, you know, after having the baby and strong enough, but not the baby would go to the nursery. Okay. Um, and folks were assigned to work there. They're like assigned, they were 24 hour on duty uh, for the nursery. And you know, the shift, they shifts changed uh, week to week or, or however they had it set up. But in the same with the school, when you were two and a half or so, you were potty trained and you, you went to the school mm -hmm. and you started your formal education. Mm -hmm. uh, and you go to school in the daytime and at night you go to the dormitory and folks were assigned to be there. And so that really freed us up to, to continue to work these long, crazy hours mm -hmm. we were working. And this was how your kids <laughs> yes. came up? Yes. Picked yeah. up on Monday morning with their little bags. The van would pick them up and they'd be at school all week and they'd drop them off on Friday night with their little dirty clothes and you'd clean them all up and put them back on the van on Monday. I mean, you could go and see them during the week, you know, if you, you had time to, to drop in, but that's it. And, and they were ecstatic. They were in heaven. They were treated like little queens and kings, so uh, it was fine with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the hard, some of, the, some of the, um, my comrades now would tell me how angry their children were, my kids were, especially my oldest boy when we left. They, they were really upset that we left and mm -hmm. they had to leave the school. Mm -hmm. So it was like their little haven. <laughs> <laughs> and so advanced that when they came out, I was able to put them ahead of, a grade ahead of oh, wow. where the yeah. schools wanted to put them. I brought them to Los Angeles and they wanted to put them in school according to their ages. And I said, no, they're going to be bored in there. So I took them to San Diego and they put them in the grades that I asked them to put them in and they have all done well. The clinic here, what was the name of the clinic? It was the Alprentice Bunchy Carter People's Free Clinic. And can you tell us who Bunchy Carter was and, Bunchy and the Carter, name of the clinic? Yeah, Bunchy Carter uh, is the person who 
he and John Huggins, they started the Los Angeles chapter. Um, so in, in uh, his honor and in commemorating him, uh, we named the clinic after him. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the opportunity to go to a, a luncheon that was held for his mother about two months ago. And she was like a freedom fighter from way back. So I could see where he, he got his, uh, his desire and, and understanding about uh, equal justice for uh, folks that, that were disenfranchised and had so many unmet needs. Yeah, his mother just, she worked in programs in starting and running uh, civil rights type issues based programs here in Los Angeles for a long time. A long time, yeah, yeah. Did, did you ever meet him or did you, was it? I met, I, I was able to meet him one time mm -hmm. uh, at a rally because that was when I was just, you know, kind of coming around a little bit. I, my husband was trying to get me to formally join and I wouldn't, but I met him at a rally once. And uh, just, just very impressed by the way that he carried himself and the way that he, you know, commanded the other guys to do things. And not, not commanded in a you do this kind of thing, but the way that he, uh, the, the leadership that I saw shining th out through him, mm -hmm. just that one time that I met him, I was really impressed with that. And then later on, you know, learning more about him and, and, and reading his poetry and, and whatnot, you, you get to get a better sense of who the man really was. Yeah. What were some of the challenges? I mean, uh, we know the, the circumstances of his death um, and different ways in which that story has been told, I suppose. But um, what were some of the challenges in terms of relations with other organizations at that time? Well, there was the mainly the US organization, uh, Ron Karanka's group. Um, and my ex-husband, Albert Armour, was at UCLA when that, he was going to school there when that occurred. Um, and so, you know, hearing firsthand from him and my, one of my best friends from high school was in the party and was there at UCLA when that happened. Um, it, it just, you know, it puts a sour taste in your mouth and in, in, in your heart. It's not just, right towards that, that group of folks. Uh, right. Just for the record, could, it, could I ask you to describe what, what happened? Um, from my understanding mm -hmm. is that, uh, and Erica can give you a much better mm -hmm. uh, account of it because she was, uh, her husband was there. Um, well, was killed with Bunchy. Um, there, there, there was some difference in ideology about how things should be um, run in terms of the Black Student Union and what was happening with the Black students on campus and whatnot. And and you know the the Panthers, our, our ideology was based on um, what had happened in some other revolutions. We drew from you know from some from the Russian, some from the Chinese, and some from what happened in Cuba and try to, and things that happened in South America and, and the islands and try to put it together and make it work for, for what we have here. Mm -hmm. And um, the um, well, dialectical materialism with, you know, you know, the, you know, the rhetoric. Um, and the US organization, they were very uh, Afrocentric you know, referring everything back to Africa, and that's that's not something that we did at, at that time, you know. Um, and so just rifts occur. Even when I was pregnant with my daughter and I was out selling papers one day, I was attacked by people from the US organization. I mean, I just happened to grow up with six brothers and they they couldn't handle me, so. <laughs> You know, and we were on the street corner, so they, you know, they, they weren't going to try to do too much, but they did try to attack me, and I was able to, to fend them off. Um, and did those kinds of things happen? Those kinds of things happened. They would catch, uh, you know, one or two people by themselves, and you know, people would beat them up, and, and yeah, that kind of stuff happened here in, in San Diego, where us and the Panthers were there too, um, because they, I don't think that they were around in all the cities where we had mm. uh, chapters. Um, but he, I mean, and over time, you know, you, you, I, I, I consider myself to be someone who has some practice forgiveness in her heart and whatnot. That one with Karanga is just really hard because he did some other things after that. You know, he even, what, he, um, what did he have as his, I don't know if it was his wife or some other people, other women from the US organization that he was holding 
like captive and I mean just and he he never fessed up to what he did. I mean and he did and he was convicted and from what I recall he was convicted and he's still a big time professor, you know, down in San Diego and running around the country espousing his views and whatnot and I, I just I can't abide. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't have hatred. I don't I have I have enough room in my heart to be hating anybody, but He's somebody that I don't ever have to be in his presence, mm -hmm. and I'm just fine with that. Mm -hmm. So gunfire actually erupted at the, that day at UCLA, Oh, oh yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. and, um, you know, it, it came to a head because I guess these meetings were going on and, you know, harsh words and whatnot happened, and and it's from what, what we believe, what I believe, and a lot of other people believe, other people probably have more proof than I do that Karenga gave the order for those guys to shoot Bunch and John there. Because I just it, uh, and operating in collaboration with the police, probably, but hmm. that's another whole issue that you know I, I don't feel like he's really cleared himself of. And was it not long after that that the offices got raided? Or was that or was that quite a bit later? Uh, that was early on in the year, hmm. and I, I can remember the offices were raided in December, but that that occurred earlier in the year. I'm thinking. Okay. In like February in, in the winter, okay. if I remember correctly. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that, that was before I was actually in the party because I, I didn't come along to late 69. And so the, he was killed before I came into the party. Mm -hmm. Well, they were killed, Bunchy and John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you remember how people reacted to uh, their deaths? Uh, like I said, I was not you were in the right. party. You were not in yet. Yeah, yeah. uh huh. But the what happened then, you know, it it, it just the carryover afterwards. It just kind of kept on the 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 uh, the sentiments between the Panthers and the us organization mm -hmm. got even worse. Mm -hmm. um, you you and at that time, well you go out and you would be collecting donations or selling papers and there were special corners where you would have more foot traffic and you would probably get, you know, have more sales and whatnot. Um, one corner would be Black Panthers, another corner would be the US organization, one corner would be the, the Nation of Islam, and another corner would be the, 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 the Holy Ghost filled Christians. <laughs> where were the Holy so, Christians? <laughs> they were at the airport mostly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it was, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was a time. I mean, it, it was very interesting period of time in the 60s and 70s, just watching mm -hmm. all the different ideas and, and, you know, people had about how, how we should be right. in this country. Now, we didn't have as, the gang situation that we have now, obviously, in L.A., but Slauson, the Slossons were around. We had gangs before mm -hmm. the party, and like I said, the community came into the party, and when she came to the party, we weren't gang members anymore. We, we had the, the Slossons, the Pueblos, mm -hmm. we had the, the, the Body Snatchers, we had the Roman Twenties, we had a lot of gangs. Mm -hmm. um, but the party attracted a lot of those folks because, I mean, they were out there, they had the misplaced aggression. They were mad and upset. They knew something wasn't right, but they were taking it out on the wrong folks. And once they got a little bit of uh, consciousness uh, under their belt, then they saw, you know, there's another way for me to channel my energies. Mm -hmm. And no, we didn't have this gang kind of situation here in L.A. until the, the party left and then the powers that be brought the, dumped all the crack here and the gangs and, and it's... Was, were there any times when, because uh, I know this from some of the other chapters, where y you are bringing in people from the streets uh, who have legitimate reasons to be angry, and a lot of it, and uh, you know, and you're trying to be disciplined, right? But things spill out. Was there any? Yeah, you know, people, sometimes <laughs> people explode, you know. Yeah. But I mean, you, you and you you try to handle it diplomatically, but and and we all know that we all came with a whole bunch of different types of baggage. Mm -hmm. And you just try to deal with it case by case. Or, you know, so-and-so is, so -and -so is liable to go off at any time, so don't go talking crazy around them, especially today because such and such happened. And you, yeah. 
I mean, you know, and over time, hopefully some of those uh, temperaments change, you know, and some of them, they didn't, then they left, but they were asked to leave mm. or kicked out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And did that happen? Yeah, people got kicked out, people got suspended, people mm -hmm. left on their own. So you mentioned earlier, but you so you started uh, with the clinic here, yes. and then you got reassigned up north, right? Yes. Well, actually, here I was working with the finance. One, I mentioned that a few of the women actually went up north every year, every week to work on the newspaper. Well, the person who was in charge of finances here um, knew that I, I I was pretty good with math, and so she became my mentor. She trained me how to handle the finances as well when she was gone. So I was doing the clinic, but I was also doing the finances. Um, so that, that's what I was doing here, both of those. And then when there was a call for all the uh, chapters to uh, move up north to work in the, the political campaigns that we were starting, um, I was assigned to the George Jackson Free Clinic in mm -hmm. Berkeley and became the, the director there. Um, did, did you co go with the whole family? Is that when the kids were in school? Uh, the, well, actually, my two-year-old was already there. He went when he was about two and a half or maybe close to three. He was already up at the school. And my daughter went with me because she was, she was only a few months old when we moved. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so when I went there, I, I became in charge of that clinic, and it was operated pretty much the same way. Um, we had a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of folks that I collaborated with there, though, and because Berkeley is just the heart of collaboration and, and unity and, and getting things done. We had um, the, the Berkeley Free Clinic. We had the Women's Health Collective. Uh, Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic sent folks over to teach us about uh, substance abuse. So that was my first training in, in drug abuse. Is that where your dad worked? My dad and his friends. <laughs> uh, the Haight-Ashbury Clinic. Yeah. We, we lived right around the corner. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so we, 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 we got a lot of uh, help from them. Um, and there was an organization called Community Services United, which was a, a coalition of nonprofits who received funding from Berkeley City. And we met monthly to mainly to let each other know what we were doing so that we could avoid duplication of services. So that if you wanted to go and ask for money, you weren't asked for money that the city was already uh, funding something for. Um, and so that, yeah, that there were a lot of people that we worked with. And we worked with um, UC Berkeley had a group called the Black Health Science Caucus. These were pre-med students. Um, who came and volunteered their time and worked in the labs and, and worked in the clinic and taught us how to do, you know, different lab work. Um, here in Los Angeles, but more so in Berkeley, I and some of the other clinic workers, were we were taught a lot about medicine. We were, I tell folks, we were probably practicing medicine without a license, but we had physicians there who were overseeing what we were doing. We worked with a lot of um, vet, Vietnam vets who were corpsmen as well. So they had a lot of on-the-ground skills uh, about how, how do you work with folks in, in emergent-type situations and whatnot. So we, we, we learned how to draw blood. We learned how to do stitches. We worked on frankfurters. We worked on wieners to, to do stitches because the skin is real sensitive, and it's like real people's skin. So mm -hmm. um, we did women's uh, exams. We did vaginal exams. And... I have a very personal experience with that, that we would practice on each other and then we would send our labs out. So mine came back positive for uh, cervical cancer or, or something irregular. So I said, nah, so we did it again and sent it out again, came back again. So I went to my gynecologist and sure enough, I had to have surgery. But that's how I found out that I had cervical cancer and I forget that I'm a cancer survivor these days because I caught it so early, I just so never, early. never think in terms of being a survivor. Mm. But I am, and that's how I found that's out. That's really funny. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah but we, uh, the Merck manual, the, I mean, it just tells you about all the different diseases and illnesses and whatnot. We, we, just, we just read this stuff, you know, like it was a novel or something. We just collected all this What's our information. bodies ourselves out? Oh, hey, I got one on the <laughs> shelf still. <laughs> I've given it to all my girls, my daughters, my granddaughters. Yeah. Yes, the Women's Health Collective book. Yeah, we, 
And we, we try to teach people to take care of themselves, you know, as best they could. Don't get sick and you don't have to worry about getting well as much as you can. I mean, some of it's hereditary and you just have to watch out for those types of, of things to, to stay ahead of uh, diabetes and, you know, watching your sugar, watching your weight and that kind of stuff. So we exercising. So we, we were... We were trying to do all that. Was that mm -hmm. part of the party platform too, to maintain personal mm -hmm. health and Let's rigor? Let's see, what was the, one of our, uh, well, I used to tell people, woe, woe to those who treat their bodies as though they belong to themselves. Mm -hmm. It was something from Mao or something. <laughs> well, we changed it around a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that we, folks needed to be well. Mm -hmm. We needed to be well. And we had a communicable, communicable disease control program too. We had an outbreak of uh, Shigella uh, at uh, one of the uh, one of the sites, and we worked with the pediatricians. We had pediatricians from Children's Hospital who came and ran the pediatric clinic for us. Uh, some of the residents came and did that, and we were taught, you know, that you need to separate them from other people until they're asymptomatic, and then they can go back. Cause everybody's living communal. One person gets something, then it's spread like wildfire. Same thing with chicken pox. Two or three kids in one facility, you know, everybody was going to get chicken pox. So they were, everybody were just confined there until. Mm -hmm. and Bring the in same, the ones that hadn't had it yet. And yeah, sure let the it. kids go ahead, let them get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then during the time of, um, you know, the 60s, free love, you know, free speech, free love, flower children. I think we probably treated more uh, STIs, STDs at the clinic than we treated a lot of, especially in Berkeley, than we treated uh, other things. But we had control in the clinic uh, like that. It's, we were bringing in folks from all over the country. So as soon as you got to town, you had to come and get your medical screening. Mm -hmm. And you got screened for gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, you know, whatever. Did you have a, a yeast infection? You got treated. If you had something that someone else could catch by you having sex with them, you were put on a list, and you were not to have, and that list was published, and you were not to have sex with anyone that was on that list. This was within the party. There was no HIPAA laws in the party. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's how you control, because it was rampant. I mean, in Berkeley, there, there was, in the Bay Area, there was just a lot of uh, STDs at that time, because everybody was, you know, it was free love. <laughs> That's what wild. a time. <laughs> and that's wild. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> so we are in Berkeley. Yes. Um, so how long were you all up there? Or were you up there? I was there. F I was in the Bay Area from 72 to 77. Mm -hmm. um, and I ran the clinic from 72 to about 74 or so. Um, and that was by the time that, that Huey left the party, then Bobby left, and then Elaine became the person in charge. And she knew that I had the experience. Uh, the, the person who handled the finances here was handling, then handling the finances there. And she knew that I had the experience from Los Angeles. So she asked me would I come and become the Minister of Finance. So I left the clinic and started handling the, the headquarters finances mm -hmm. for the party. Were you there when Elaine was made president that, that, that evening or day when she was announced as the... The head of the Black Panther Party? I, I probably was. Yeah. Uh, um, actually, I was just recovering from surgery, so I may not have been, I was there in the area, but I may not have been at the particular event. Um, like I said, I had a relapse, and so she asked me while I was recovering would I take over the finances mm -hmm. because that's when a big shift in personnel, I guess you call it now. <laughs> right. Um, and so I told her, yeah, so right at that was like in, Late 74, I started handling the finances. So you worked out of headquarters in Oakland? And my home. Oh, mm -hmm. at your home. Yeah, and, and yeah. Oakland headquarters. But yeah. yeah, I did a lot of the work from where I lived as well. Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell me what that was like, especially that transition? Yeah. Well, I, like I said, I, I, I was used to handling the finances here. So it was just on a bigger scale there. Um, I had to make sure that uh, the funds were accounted for when folks came in from... Um, getting donations, selling papers, if people gave us donations, um, to make sure that, that all the, the properties were, the, the notes and the rents were paid, utilities, and people had money for food and 
you know, they, they had the, the clothing if they didn't have other kinds of income. But everyone who had some kind of income, this was one of the edits that Elaine came up with, everyone that had some kind of income paid a tithe. Whatever you got, 10% went into the pot for the various survival programs and to maintain the facilities where you lived and whatnot. Um, so I, I was responsible for making sure that the money got collected and distributed, bills paid properly. Um, later, we were able to incorporate the school and get grants. So mm -hmm. then I had to learn to be an accountant and do bookkeeping officially before I was just keeping things in ledgers. But I had to learn to, to actually do the accounting records, uh, keep those together and bring them up to the point of trial balance and then give them to the CPA to do the 990 tax returns. And so that was my introduction into the real nonprofit world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I did that from 74 till 77. Um, and since then, I mean, I've, I've been doing health and finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did you, well, a couple of questions. One is, I'm just curious, so you, you were married. Mm -hmm. Is it was it difficult to maintain a relationship during this Yes. Time? My, when I moved to Oakland, my husband was still stationed in Los Angeles. And I was in Oakland and for probably a couple of years. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just strained. It was strained, you know, and we never really got back together until we both left the party. So, you, 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 you know, we went our separate ways and um, the kids, I'd have the kids one weekend and then he'd have them because he did eventually move there. But he became uh, stricken with multiple sclerosis and was, you know, what he could do was limited. He actually became my assistant in the finance area because he couldn't do a lot of field work. So we worked together very closely up there. Even even when we weren't living as husband and wife, we, right. we made friends over the years. Right. Yeah, yeah it, 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 was, it was difficult. There were a number of folks that came in, uh, a couple, and I don't know if any of them left that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not to say with the high degree of divorce in our community that it wouldn't anyway. have happened anyway. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Talk about that later. Um, so, uh, can, can you tell me the, the story of leaving the, the party? <laughs> yes, I will. Um, Huey came back from uh, Cuba, and it's, it's, you know, things were just starting to be so different. Uh, because when Elaine took over, we started doing more... Um, what you say, mainstream type uh, funding. We got, we even had a law enforcement grant to run some of the, the services that we, we had the school nonprofit, then we had a, a nonprofit that was like a social service uh, wing that worked with all these other programs. The clinic fell under that, the seniors program fell under that, clothing, food, other programs outside of education fell under that social service wing. Um, so that we were used to, we were getting into operating more legitimately as far as other people were concerned, but it also helped to bring in monies that made our program sustainable. Um, and when Huey came back, you know, th things just, they just changed. He had some different ideas and uh, he, I don't know, I, I, he may have just been so brilliant that it, it was just, you know, a lot of brilliant people, they just kind of, that especially those that are so forward thinking, this is my idea, uh, that he was so forward thinking and in a way could kind of see ahead mm -hmm. that if we kept going like this, this is where we would be. And it had be that kind of visionary, that, that could put a lot of strain on a person, especially when you're trying to get other folks to see what you see and we're too dumb. We're, we're, we're not that intelligent. We, the, the general person can't understand it like that and, and what that does to a psyche and, and a mentality of, of, of the mental health of a person. Um, so he, he, he kind of started, you know, at, acting differently and so people started leaving, um, the women started leaving and then 
when he came back, he had this charge that he left because of in the first place, that he was supposed to have uh, shot the prostitute, I believe. Um, and so the witnesses, there was one witness finally, you know, finally they, they published her address and whatnot. So he sent somebody out to kill this person. I'm, I'm putting all this stuff together in my head. So he's not around to say that he didn't do it, but this is, this is me. Okay. Um, but when he got there, when they got there, the person, they went to the wrong house. The lady's house they went to had a gun when they were trying to get in and she started shooting through the door. So she shot some of the guys that came to get the witness. And one of the guys died on the spot. And I, I said, we all live communally. So the guy that died had the same address on his license as where I was living. So once they get his prints, then they get the search warrants and whatnot. Then they come and they uh, come to, to not search, but they come to, you know, bust in my house. And um, then they, they go search everything. And, there were, there were guns around almost all the houses. They belonged to the party. There wasn't our houses, most of them. And most of them were arsenal. Most of them had some stuff, but they, they were only parts. I think at that time they felt that, you know, if, if the barrel was here and the, 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 the trigger housing was here and this was someplace else that, you know, they couldn't put any kind of charges on you. Well, that wasn't true. So when they went up to this closet, that my kids played hide and seek in. I didn't know what it was. They were just little suitcases, little police cases in there. They came and they just started carting out all kind of stuff. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to jail. <laughs> I'm going to jail. But it, 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 was, a, it was an eye-opening time. It, it really was, you know, that, that, that he would order something like that, you know, to, to save himself. Why not just stay in Cuba? And so, the, you know, the, that was, you know, things just started spiraling after that. Mm -hmm. And then people started leaving more. And I went to jail and um, then I got kicked out <laughs> because now Q, he had to fight his case. So why spend the resources to fight my case if he's going to need the resources to fight his case? So I was on my own. They uh, kicked you out of the party. Yeah. Yeah with what I had on my back. Um, so I, I left and I fought my case for uh, a year and I ended up getting uh, sentenced to two years in California State Prison, which I did uh, about 12 or 13 months and then I went to work furlough. And while in work furlough, uh, there was this Jewish woman there that worked with parolees. Um, but while I was while I was in prison, that was an interesting experience too. I I never I didn't even have traffic tickets on my records, you know. Oh, so right. I went, do not pass go go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Go directly, because that was at the time when it was not use a gun, go to jail, but have a gun, go to jail. You know how the the wind shift back mm -hmm. and forth, and it was right during that time. Have a gun, go to jail. They couldn't. My fingerprints weren't on anything. They, you know. Um, and so there were a couple of people in the jury, we got a chance to poll them afterwards, and a couple of them said that they really didn't believe that I had any control over it. Mm -hmm. But that's what it would take for you to be guilty, to have knowledge, possession, and control. Mm -hmm. so it was my house, the utilities were in my name, they said I had control of it. Mm -hmm. But anyway. So um, where, where were you uh, incarcerated? Of here at, uh, in Frontera, mm -hmm. California Institute for Women. But what, when I went there, I stayed in the reception center for three months. Normally, they transition you in, do your physical, psych, and you're out two or three weeks. Well, they were do, watching me, making sure that I wasn't going to incite a riot or something. or Foment revolution. Right yes, there. yes. They should know that was so far. I mean, at that point in my life, it was like that was the last thing I was thinking about. And so when I, they finally moved me to the main campus, they put me in a cell by myself because they didn't want me in, you know, and that was right fine with me because uh, there were some, some folks up there boy, that you wouldn't want to sell with. <laughs> I mean, because they, they, were, they were always doing things. They would be going to jail in jail. Mm -hmm. 
mm. you know, for the activities in there. Uh, not, nothing political, you know, brewing hooch and, you know, doing whatever other kinds of things that to get you locked up while you're already locked up. So, so did word circulate that you were a Black mm -hmm. Panther? And mm -hmm. what did that, what kind of response did, did that it, get from other It got inside? a lot of respect from everybody. The, um, the administration were giving me a hard time initially, um, but eventually I became secretary for the Women's Advisory Council, and I had a pass. I could go in and out of administration. I had a typewriter in my room. I went and enrolled in college class. I got my AA degree while I was there. I transferred my credits from uh, Berkeley and, and Cal State LA and got an AA and took a couple other classes. So, But when I got out at work study, this woman sent me on interviews, and I had four interviews and I was offered jobs by three people and so I went back to school, got my bachelor's in healthcare administration and um, kept working and then went back, stayed in school and got a master's in health administration, uh, mostly in administering substance abuse programs. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the age of 55 I went back to school and got a marriage and family therapy Dig <laughs> masters, um, so it, it you know I just kept moving and, and didn't look back. I mean it, it was something being in the party. I wouldn't have the skills to do the things that I've done since mm -hmm. if I hadn't been there. That was a just really unfortunate event that happened and that I had to deal with and be away from my family, you know, for that amount of time. But you know it, it's it's over and and. Uh, Chalk it up to experience and just keep moving forward. Mm. Okay. You're saying? Yeah, I didn't know that I'd ever put that on film. But <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, Can um, I wanted to ask about the other nonprofits, okay. especially Shields for Families? But um, I don't know if that was first in the progression or. Um, no. no. Well, no. I worked with um, I work with some other nonprofits here in in Los Angeles, but. In 90, I think that's 1990, um, I was working for the County Alcohol and Drug Program. Um, I stayed with them for about a year and a half. I, I, I waited too long to become a government employee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't go through the uh, just pretending to work. Because, I mean, I'm talking about my work ethic. I couldn't come into work and push the paper from this side of the desk to the other side for the evening tomorrow, come in and move it over here and like act like I'm doing something. So my supervisor and I were, um, we'd be writing grants. We'd be there late at night. We'd come in on weekends and we had over $20 million of funding to come in and support substance abuse programs and specifically women's uh, programs for women who had substance abuse problems and their children were born prenatally exposed to drugs. And, we were there when uh, Diane Watson introduced a bill into the state legislature asking to have funds set aside for the four county hospitals in Los Angeles to address that issue. Because at King Hospital, over 1,200 um, children a year were being born prenatally exposed to drugs, primarily crack. Mm -hmm. So the, the bill passed, became law. So the doctor who was a neonatologist at King called us at the county. She had worked with us on the proposal and said, you know, I know how to treat the children, but I don't know how to run a drug abuse program. You guys are going to have to come out here and run it. So my boss and I left the county, came out and started running the program. Initially, it was under the auspices of Drew Medical School. But after about a year or so, we formed our own 501c and started getting our monies directly. We started with a, uh, a grant of about a half a million dollars a year, 14 employees. And after 24 years, when I retired, uh, we had 350 employees and about $25 million in funding. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you tell us about 28 to 29 programs. Can you tell us about the first building, in quotes? <laughs> the first building, <laughs> we were uh, given an old trailer at that. Uh, it was set on the land of Drew Medical School, but the trailer belonged to uh, Martin Luther King Hospital, County Hospital in South Central that was built right after the riots um, as a direct result of that. 
But the building was so old and dilapidated, it, it should have been condemned. It had been sitting in for a long time, and you just had to watch where you stepped. Uh, certain places your foot might go, <laughs> go through to the bottom, but we, we pieced it together and uh, made it work. So we ran our program out of there for a while and were able to get funding from the Department of Health Services to help us to renovate that, that trailer and to build us another one so that we could expand. So we just started with the one program for women who had drug abuse problems, who had children zero to five. Um, and they came into the program when they were pregnant or right after they had a baby that was tested positive for drugs. And we worked with them on the substance abuse issues. Then we started seeing that they were coming in um, close to homeless or homeless. Mm -hmm. So we went out and found some apartments, got some money from HUD, put together some packaging and bought two 18-unit apartment complexes that we could house some of the women in. Um, and they just kept coming in homeless. And uh, so we found another project in Compton, um, 86 unit. So we bought that so that we could house more. And more of them were coming in with mental health issues. So we got a psychiatrist to come and work with us. So we uh, started looking at the behavioral health, the other behavioral health concerns. Um, we were able to get funding from the Department of Mental Health to help with that. Got more funding from the Department of Substance Abuse where we used to work and they were one of our main funders at the time and then still are. Um, started doing vocational services because most of the women maybe had a fourth to sixth grade education or reading level. Um, so all these are so related. There, there, there's similar programs that we had in the party. So health, I mean, so the thread. Education, yeah. And what I did at uh, Shields is I was I was the health officer for the longest. Uh, we had a major AIDS grant, and I was the primary uh, person working on that. Um, so as well as the financial piece, I became the chief operating officer. So I had some programmatic responsibilities from time to time. But yes, the, the programs that were, that and still are run out of uh, Shields, um, they, they kind of mirror the kind of work that I did when I was in the party. So mm -hmm. I, I, I can't ever regret what I did because it, it, it set the stage and, and helped me to build the skills to do what I needed to do when I came back here. And you worked through all these major epidemics. I mean, drug epidemic, AIDS, yeah. crack. Yeah. Yeah. Gang violence. Yeah. Yeah. And and Shields was very instrumental because it's in it's in Watts. We started right there on 120th and Compton. Mm -hmm. um, it now has uh, probably 17, 18 sites, and we're in uh, about 20 schools doing mental health services as well. So we're we're all over the South Central Linwood Watts Willowbrook mm -hmm. area, and even down that far from here, we have a resource center. Um, yeah, I've, I've watched, I've seen a lot of things mm -hmm. come and go, and I've, I've seen so much cyclical stuff happening. Now with healthcare reform, which I'm really happy passed, we're having some, some unexpected consequences as a result of it. Um, there's still a lot of bugs to be worked out. But we went from, we're now we're going back to what they call a medical model, where they want substance abuse services to be treated in the medical facility. Um, and we fought to change that back in the 80s and mm -hmm. 90s and were able to have substance abuse looked at differently because, you know, there are some aspects that are a lot different. That's not to say that it couldn't be treated. Uh, and it's good to have the integrated care. It's just we're really concerned that they're now going to be excluding the people that have done the treatment <laughs> services for so long and upping the requirements for them to have degrees, um, and a lot of these folks are recovering people who have, you know, they've learned certain sets of skills, and they, it, we just don't know what's going to happen with that yeah. now. Yeah. Is that difficult when you see things cycle back? Oh, it is. I think about Mother May I, you know, you take two baby steps forward and ten giant steps backwards, and you think, you know, I, I did all this, I, I stayed up all those long hours, for what? Or sometimes you wonder, you know, how, how could we have let it roll back like this again? But, but I, I think we'll work out that medical piece uh, as, as long as Trump doesn't get elected. We'll, mm -hmm. be able to, we'll be able to work through some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've gone, I've uh, retired from Shields, but 
um, I was asked to become part of community faculty at Drew Medical School. Okay. Which is a Full circle again. It's a yeah. different type of, of tract of uh, instructors. We, there are people like me who have been working in the community with nonprofits, uh, running nonprofits and, um, for years and years. And what we are commissioned to do is to work with the medical students, nursing students, MPH students, to help them to understand the community better, help them to understand better the social determinants of health. What a phenomenal program. <laughs> yes. Are yes. there others in the country doing this? or is no. this? Yeah. No, we're the only one. Um, so, 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 you know, and, and because we think it's so important that they need to, to learn those skills. It's so unfair to send the students out into the community to work in, especially ones that aren't from this community. They don't, they don't know. They don't know that just because you give this person a prescription doesn't mean they're going to take it. First of all, it doesn't even mean that they're going to buy it because they may not have the money. Mm -hmm. They may not trust you because they keep thinking about the, the, the research and, and all that kind of stuff that's happened with uh, pe people of color over the years. Mm -hmm. So they don't trust the medical system or they, they, don't, they can't read what, that, what you just written and given to them. It's just all kinds of uh, and then you go home with the family dynamics and uh, they say, oh, no, you don't take that here. You take these herbs and uh, mix it with this bark and do that. You know, you don't take that medicine. So it's all these other social determinants of health that, you know, the students have to be trained uh, on. And even the existing, the current professors, it, it's a hard thing because a lot of the old guys, they're not trying to change what they're thinking. So when you go and try to teach the students and they get in the classroom and then they tell them, what they've always told them. And, and I keep saying we got to think of a different way to do something because obviously what we're doing is not working because my people are still dying from illness. Something's not working somewhere, so we need to you know, tweak this a little mm -hmm. bit. <laughs> but to turn to those who've actually been working in the trenches yeah. makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's been interesting, and mm -hmm. I've, I've been able to. Uh, Drew falls under the auspices of UCLA. Mm -hmm. So I work with some uh, doctors and nurses there, and especially in the research department. Um, and I've been working on some of the committees to look at diversity in the medical education curriculum. Um, and how do we train the physicians and how do we train the existing instructors? Uh, how do we train the students mm -hmm. uh, about some of these concepts that you know, we, we think that they need to know about working in our communities? Amazing. So that's what you're doing now? Yeah, I yeah. do that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Sit on some, some advisory boards for mm -hmm. diabetes and uh, stroke prevention and things like that. But more, more health related things now. I when I heard you'd retired, I didn't think that that would last long. <laughs> I think so. How do you retire from a passion? I keep trying. You know, I, I'm learning to say no more. Mm -hmm. I haven't learned to say no all the time yet, but I'm, I'm going to get there one day. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the Panthers for a, a moment, what are, your, what are your thoughts about how the Panthers are remembered or thought of? You know, and this is and I, again like work, working with kids and what people know, and mm. I'm am curious what your thoughts are on, um, on that. things that I I think that I'd like to see them the, yeah um, you know, remembered or, for. Or, or, ways in which you think you you know maybe the Panthers are, are misremembered or misrepresented, or w what you would like kids to know. Especially. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the, the whole piece about the um, guns and, and uh, um, self-defense, I mean, that, 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 that was important. I mean, because if, if you're dead, all the rest of this doesn't count. There's no even no need to look at anything else. So we have to make sure that we're safe first. But that wasn't, that wasn't the height. That wasn't the, the ultimate of what the party was about. We had a, a plethora of survival programs, and we called it survival pending revolution because we knew it would be a long, protracted struggle before we got to see any of the changes made that, that we knew needed to occur in order for us to, to our people to start living a better life. Um, and when I say our people, I'm talking about all poor and oppressed people in this country and the world because the United States you know, they had their tentacles all over the place. Um, but I'd like them to know that, that, that the party was 
interested in children and uh, in adults in every facet of our lives to make sure that we had the best life possible. And we did what we could to, to make that happen for as long as we could do it. Is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have asked? Mm. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It's just my, my, my children, you know, it's interesting that children have a different yeah. take on things, yeah. you know, and my daughter, she's, she's right out there, she's an educator, but she's really for making sure that the, the children of color get what they need um, and runs into a lot of obstacles in the educational systems because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but they, what she remembers most uh, about the party was the, the camaraderie, mm -hmm. and, and she still has friends that she still collaborates with. And mm -hmm. when she left, she was only about, I think maybe she was six or seven years old. Right. But she grew yeah. up in it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and she, she's still in touch with those people, mm -hmm. and those are like lifelong friends, friends forever. Right, right. <laughs> But yeah, I, I just like the young people to know that, you know, and I'd like for them not to make some of the mistakes that we made, mm -hmm. to be open to hear uh, our stories, mm -hmm. uh, to see where we stepped in the ditch so that they don't have to step in that same ditch. They can move around it and go higher and farther than we mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do, I do think one thing I wanted, else I wanted to ask you, we talked a little bit before we started the camera about working with other uh, like-minded organizations, especially the Brown Berets. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about what, what those kind of uh, coalition building Yes, uh, I, I can were? remember um, working in, in some of their rallies uh, and uh, just coalescing with them in, in activities and um, uh, events that, that they were having and, and having similar ideologies and and I can remember some of our party members going out and working with Cesar Chavez mm -hmm. and the farm workers um, and just forming coalitions with, you know, who was ever open to talk about, let's, let's make some changes in this country because we know if we can make them here, hopefully that will be able to extend out through the rest of the world mm -hmm. where people are oppressed like they are here. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I, I was mostly focused on the health piece, I didn't get a chance to, to be out more. And at that time, more people in the top leadership were doing that. I didn't really become in the part of the executive committee until I became the finance minister in Oakland. Right. So a lot had happened before I got to that point. Yeah. Good. I just want to ask about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but there, there was a lot of coalescing going on mm -hmm. with the, the Gray Panthers mm -hmm. and with, you know, with the seniors. Mm -hmm. um, and in the universities, and uh, yeah. And the anti-war movement. Oh, yeah. Student, uh, the, the women's, the women's movement. movement. Yes, yeah. yes, all of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fellas, any questions? No. I was wondering about that coconut water. <laughs> Help well, yourself. I, 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 did, I guess I did have one question. What, you know, you mentioned talking to young people today and what you could tell them that might demystify some of the other sort of unfortunate and you know, pernicious mythologies about the Panthers, but in your own mind, what, looking back on it, 40 years ago, when you walked in that door of the Panther Party, did, did you ever see that trajectory taking you to where it was now? I did not. I, I, I did not see myself as a visionary. I guess I, I, I still don't, maybe in some regards I, I might be, but I was, I was more a day-to-day -day, uh, grinder get the get the work done make sure the books are okay make sure the health is okay i i, I guess maybe is it the my left side of my brain is just it's totally taxed and and i haven't really exercised to write very much i'm trying to do more of that now and uh stepping out and thinking about different things that might occur but i never felt like i really had the time mm -hmm. to allow myself to to let my mind go there it was like, okay, here I am today, and then you go three or four years, and you look back, and you say, my goodness, how did I get here? I, I didn't, I didn't expect to be at this point, and, and a lot of times you didn't, you didn't even know if you were going to be alive the next year. So, 
that kept a lot of us, I think, from thinking ahead like that. To, but to be thinking that I would come out of the party, especially after being in prison, and being able to keep moving ahead and moving up and still being able to do the same types of work on a broader scale uh, as I came back to this community, it's just not something that ever even crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm glad that I had that experience and uh, skills to be able to come and do that. Well, we're, we're grateful to you for the work well, that thank you've done you. thank and you. for sharing your story today. Thank you we for thank you. involving me. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.